Welcome to Collider Mailbag, the weekend show where we answer your viewers' submitted questions. How do you get those questions on? You email us at collidervideo at gmail.com. We answer them here on the weekend or we answer them during Movie Talk, which is Monday through Friday. This is kind of a more laid back show. I am joined today by Mark Riley. Hello, everyone. As Prince Akeem said in Coming to America, I am very happy to be here. <laughs> <laughs> and Wendy Lee, uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Hi, everybody. And let's get on with the first uh, mailbag. All right. First one comes from Meg Dorsey, who writes, Hi, Collider team. Thanks for providing insightful commentary on films day after day and week after week. My question is, if you could pick one actor and one actress known as a TV actor or actress to make the jump to break out leading man or woman in movies, a la Brian Cranston, who would they be? I would vote for Nathan Fillion and Amy Acker. Several years ago, I would have said Idris Elba from mm. Luther and the Wire, yeah. and I would have said Benedict Cumberbatch from Sherlock. But now both of them are... <laughs> you got your wish. Yeah, they're <laughs> leading men in in movies. Uh, nowadays, I would say probably Timothy Oliphant from Deadwood and Justified. Yeah. He, he was a lead. He did a, that, that first Hitman movie that wasn't received very well. Right. He just had like a little part in that Mother's Day movie. Uh, also wasn't received very well. I think he's a, car a guy that has like charisma to him. What were you going to say? He was great in Go. Do okay. you remember? No, do, you, do you ever no, see, I Go? see Go? Go is one of those movies that I love. It's uh, It was not it was like kind of swingers it was doug lyman yeah after swingers it had this great vibe to it he was fantastic in that movie you know what he was good in hmm. scream 2 there you go he was one of the that was the first thing i ever saw him that's in. right was, that's oh, right you know he was uh, one of the, the girl next door you yeah, that yeah, oh, yeah Isaac, that, that's he, a great movie yeah I love that's an that underrated movie. movie because yep. of what it's about people are like uh oh, it's because it's like about a porn actress yeah but it's actually it's kind of heartwarming it is he falls in love with a porn actress and they fall in love and yeah you know who else is in that movie <laughs> who paul dano that's right and paul <laughs> i paul was almost dano. gonna say something paul dano has uh <laughs> apparently he does the the sex ed bit at the end and he becomes a kind of a legend because of his Mm -hmm. you know endowment mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah 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 um so that would be mine for a guy for a female lena hetty i think what she's doing on game of thrones as cersei is fantastic it's, she's making a character that, that easily and i know some people still hate her but to me you can empathize and sympathize even though you know she's a bad person uh and also she was fantastic as sarah connor in terminator the sarah connor chronicles yeah she was uh i would love to see she was in the purge which actually did very well, but they kind of carried the franchise over as more of the, like now it's Frank Grillo's thing versus right. vis versus her and Ethan Hawke's thing. So she's one that I would like to see break out. What about you, Riley? Uh, I love Nathan Fillion. I mm. mean, Nathan Fillion has been on the verge of breaking out for now 20 years. I mean, well, he's broken he's out so on good. TV now, though. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's broken out on TV, but I've always wanted him to be a big time actor. Every time he's in a movie, I'm excited. Um, I immediately go to Andrew Lincoln from uh, okay. Walking oh, Dead. I yeah. think he's fantastic in The Walking Dead. Um, he had a very, very sweet part in, um, what's that movie? Oh, God, I'm, I'm losing the movie. It's the Christmas movie. Oh, Love, that, actually. Love it, yeah. Ah. He was so sweet in that movie. I'm, I'm a sucker for that movie, and I think, I think he was great. But he's, he's somebody I could see being a leading man. Same with Norman Reedus. I think mm -hmm. Norman Reedus is, is great in Walking Dead. Would love to see him. Wendy? Well, since they mentioned uh, Nathan Fillion and Amy Acker, it made me think of Joss Whedon, which then made me think of Summer Glau. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. She, she was also in Terminator Sarah Yes, and she was really, really great. And I have way more picked out for actors for some reason. I picked um, Tom Cavanaugh. I picked Johnny Lee Miller, mm. uh, John Bernthal. John Bernthal, yes, definitely. David Tennant and Robert Carlyle, who was in Once Upon a Time as Rumble Stillskin. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's been in some movies here and there, but it never mm -hmm. broke out. Right. I mean, he was in, what, Train Spotting and. Right. And uh, a bunch of other movies. He was in Stargate SGU or really? whatever that, or yeah, Stargate wow. SGU for a while. And then, um, man. Oh, speaking of uh, Nathan Fillion, though, <coughs> they canceled Castle. Yeah, Castle. <laughs> <they, they laughs> Castle's done. It's canceled. But it's, it was weird, though. They, he, like, so they said the, the female, I forgot the actress's name, but the, basically his co lead. Oh, right. Stana Kadic. Yeah. yeah. They, they, they said, we're not going to have her back because we can't afford to have her 
and Nathan Fillion. But we're going to keep going on with the show with just Nathan Which Fillion. Which I don't think, in my opinion, because I'm a fan of the show, would not have worked. And then so he resigned. Nathan Fillion resigned. And, and renegotiated. So, they yeah. went through this whole mm. big thing about salary, mm. and they figured and, and it yeah, out. And, and then they just canceled. So yeah. I guess he's got more time to be in movies now. So there where am go. I going to get my Nathan Fillion fix for now? You can go stalk him at Comic-Con or something like that. Every year I do. Yeah. I try. <laughs> okay. All right. What's next? All right. Next one comes from Brent D., who writes, Hello, Collider Crew. Can you give us a quick overview of how a movie is made from start to finish? For example, is the score written after the picture is in the can, and is that before or after the special effects are added? Thank you for the entertaining yet informative programs. May the odds be ever in your favor. This is tough because, yes, there is a definite process, but for every movie, it's different. So, for example, like the script. If the script is something that is going to be based on like one of these franchise films, let's say a Marvel movie or a DC movie, then they already know they're making the movie. Mm -hmm. They commission the, the writer to, to write it to the story that they want that fits into their universe. Other people may be writing scripts like the movie being John Malkovich. Mm. That was written as a spec script that was being passed around Hollywood. And strangely enough, they decide to make a movie out of it. They found it and they're like, oh, wow, this is such a great script, even though it's odd and quirky. Let's make a movie out of it. And then they take that and produce it. So, and then there's always differences in, in whether, you know, direct, directors are attached first or actors are, are, are attached first. It's all different. But anyways, after they get all the pre-production stuff done, which is, is all that the script, the, the producers, the actors, the directors, all that stuff done, then they go into production, they shoot the movie. But even during production, they're sending the footage back to post-production. And they're, yeah. they're starting to rough it out. They're trying to look at stuff and they're getting the process done. And then once, once the production is done, post-production can finally get into that. I think the most important thing is a thing called picture lock, which is when the movie is completely done edited. That doesn't mean the movie is completely done. Right. It just means that you're they're not going to change any of the edits anymore. That means that that all the lines that are going to be in there, all the story, all whatever is is locked. Then they can kind of now work on the visual effects, they can work on the sound mixing and all that stuff and towards the end of the film that's when all the things like like the score, they work on the score throughout the production process but they don't finalize it until they get picture locked that way they can get all the musical cues in there right um you guys have anything else to add no that was a great way to yeah. to, to describe it and especially uh, i'll add like with marvel movies especially when they announce these movies coming from years out mm -hmm. um actually in one of the interviews uh, i think uh was here the the screenwriters they were talking about the big airport scene mm -hmm. and how they had to tweak that a lot in the writing process and they would be sending that to do the special effects way ahead of time mm -hmm. so that they could lock down on that. And I think that happens a lot with these big blockbusters now, especially what's known as set pieces. They they lock in the set pieces, these big action scenes that are gonna happen in all these movies so they can get the, the visual effects guys like ahead of the game. So, and then because you mentioned, and I love one of the, the processes of scoring the movie, mm -hmm. like that's done when it's locked and yeah. they wanna go through and, you know, it's called spotting where they go, okay, we wanna put this here and put this here. That's always really fun. So I always like watching like behind the footage stuff where they have the orchestra watching on the screen of like a yeah. sequence and then they're playing to it so it kind of matches up. It's yeah. Great. Yeah. And we just had the, the announcement uh, maybe last week about Michael Giacchino doing mm -hmm. the score for Doctor Strange. Right. And, right. And, you know, that probably later in the either they they held back that announcement or 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 it's later than usual in the process yeah yeah it's i mean because he's probably not going to score it because they just wrapped that as well so it kind of came at the same time of wrapping principal photography and announcing him so i would think that like giancino he's probably sitting around thinking of it mm -hmm. but he's going to have a you, wendy you were talking about some of those behind the scenes video mm -hmm. great video of john williams spotting empire mm -hmm. strikes back with Irvin Kirshner, so rad. It was like months out, they were still working on the process, and like Williams and Irvin Kirshner were like, oh, we should put music here, we should put movies, music here. This will <laughs> probably happen with Derrickson and Giacchino with Doctor Strange, probably comes out in November. They'll probably start doing that in maybe August or, I don't know, September? Yeah. Yeah. And even yeah. a situation like The Magnificent Seven, you had James Horner who pa sadly passed away. Yeah. He'd already written a lot of music for the Magnificent Seven, but he hasn't s done the spotting yet, obviously. Right. So they're going to take his music and then 
fit it in there, and I'm sure they'll get another composer in there to, to tweak it so it fits in with the musical cues. God, I'm glad they're doing that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. All right, what's next? Andreas Renberg writes, Hello, Collider crew. I got two short questions about the future of the X-Men universe. Do you think Fox will do the Phoenix story again? Also, what story would you like to see in the future X-Men movies? Something that is based on source material or something new? Okay, so I've already seen X-Men Apocalypse. So I will say this. Before I saw X-Men Apocalypse, I thought, yes, they will do the Phoenix story once again because Brian Singer did not do it. It was it was Brett Ratner in the third uh, X-Men film, and I think that he wants to try his pass at it. After seeing it, I still think that they will do a Phoenix story. So that's it. I don't want to spoil anything. In terms of X-Men story that I would love to see, my favorite X-Men storyline is actually the one regarding the legacy virus that involves Cable and a character named Strife. I don't want to spoil it just in case they actually do it someday, but it's an intriguing dynamic between those two characters and the existing characters in the X-Men. Uh, mm. Riley, what about you? I I think immediately for X-Men, I think of uh, Joss Whedon's run on Uncanny X-Men, and throughout the run, I guess, would you say a spoiler? I mean, a comic book character dies and he comes back. Okay. Um, and it's Colossus. What the hell? I'm going to spoil the comic book run. He comes back. Don't worry about it. But that was such a great, because in, in the comic book series, Colossus and Kitty Pride were together, which I thought was interesting. And so when he comes back, it was it was a very cool take. That's an interesting story that kind of comes to mind. Um, I if, as, as far as, a, I'm glad you're saying something about the Phoenix. The, mm-hmm. the Dark Phoenix saga is my favorite all time. Ruined by Ratner. Mm. Absolutely <laughs> ruined. I want it. I would love for it to happen. Um, I think I think it, it's primed for it. I think we could do it. So that's what I would hope for. Wendy? I think they are most likely, yes, they're going to do the mm-hmm. Phoenix storyline. And just putting it out there, when I first learned that Sophie Turner was going to play Jean Grey, I was like, nah, forget it. They ruined it all over again. And then I saw the movie with you. Mm-hmm. And then I ate my words, and I'm like, God, I actually like, I like, I actually like her. Wouldn't Sansa. mind seeing her more. Sounds good. Sansa. Sansa. So there you go. Okay. What's next? All right. Nick Gerswall writes, "Hey there, Collider crew. While the box office of Civil War was nothing to scoff at, it was below the estimated amount. You guys talked about whether superhero fatigue or BVS affected it. Well, what about the marketing? For me personally, I felt that the hype started to die off before the movie ever came out." With the critics showings a month before opening and various media platforms discussing the movie that entire time gap, it started to get old. It also appeared that they were dropping TV spots with new footage every other day. Do you guys think that Marvel might have actually hurt themselves with Civil War's promotional schedule? Uh, I think so domestically. I agree it was a bit early. I mean, to my benefit, I guess it's yeah. so early. <laughs> sure, but in terms of domestic, but the reason why I'm sure they did it is for international. We talked about this on Friday's movie talk. The international box office is now not any individual country, but collectively more important to the studio. So they want to go out there and promote it. I mean, Civil War opened on in many other countries Way before before, before the U.S. And so I think that was part of it. They did their tour then. And, and it probably hurt America's box office a little bit, but it was to them worth it because internationally it killed oh, at yeah. the box office. Riley? Yeah, I, this is something I've been talking about for a while now, and it happened especially for me with uh, Avengers Age of Ultron. There were so many damn spots. I felt the movie was ruined. And I, I hate to say it, but I walked in a little bit like, I wanted to see it. Don't get me wrong. I'm going to see these movies. They're made for me. I love them. But I walked in just with a little bit of like, eh. So I think about that for a non like movie geek like me. Like if they're seeing it, like definitely works with my dad. He see, like, he's like, I saw everything. I don't need to go. That happens a lot for my dad, but that's the older generation. So I wish they would kind of turn down the marketing sometimes and just kind of let the movie, just the hype like just spread, mm-hmm. you know, like a civil war. Yeah, it was, there was a lot of spots too. I was having the same kind of thing where I'm like, okay, okay, enough. I don't want to hear anymore. I don't want to see anymore. Um, if they just turned it down a little bit, you know, I, I would be happy. That's my personal opinion. I totally agree. I thought um, the TV spots got a little oversaturated mm-hmm. and it was just everywhere you looked, it was hard to, you know, avoid spoilers and things you don't want to see. Also, I read in um, our comment section for one of the movie talks that it was, I guess, finals week for a lot of college students during the week of release, which is why a lot of people 
weren't able to make it out because it's oh. like, do you pass college and do you graduate or do you go see a movie? Go yeah. see a movie. <laughs> yeah. Go see a movie. <clears throat> All right, what's next? All right, Malik Tarin writes, Hey guys, love movie talk. Been a fan for about two years now, and I want to thank you all for getting me to fall in love with movies I wouldn't normally watch if I was stuck with the general audience. And this mostly goes to Perry for her constant raving on Room. Recently, some actors such as Emma Thompson and Michael Caine have spoken out over the idea that the younger generation of actors are now only being cast in films or other projects because of their social media following, rather than their actual ability to act. In most ways, I can't help but... Ad- but agree. Being a 20-year-old aspiring actor myself and hearing of other people being turned down roles because John Doe from YouTube or Jane Doe from Instagram have so-and-so followers, what are your thoughts on the matter? Thanks and bring on the filthy. It's definitely something of concern because Mm -hmm. then you get into a situation of where then our studio is going to just start casting people purely based on their followings. And I think Mm -hmm. this is a problem that's actually going to get worse before it gets better. Yeah. But at the same time, though, I really haven't heard of any movies or even television projects that that involve like kind of big either YouTubers or people with big social media followings that actually has done really well. You know, I've, it's, it's more of these smaller movies and maybe they did OK, but I haven't heard of any. You haven't heard of like a big movie that, oh, because this person from YouTube is in it, 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 mm-hmm. it, it, like, it breaks big. So I. I, I definitely am concerned, and, but at the same time, I don't blame the people. Like, if, if someone has a role because they have a big social media following, it's like, what are they going to do? Turn it down? Right. Yeah. They they they, mm-hmm. they want a job and they want money and they definitely are getting a leg up. Uh, I I don't know if you know, maybe it would be the best for them to be in this particular role, but I can't blame them for trying to take advantage of, uh, of it, Riley. Yeah, I, I I definitely think that there's. They're trying to do this right now. They're trying to take some YouTube stars with large followings and put them in movies. Um, I know I'm trying to find some stuff. I know that there was a movie that was actually just cast with a lot of YouTube personalities. Mm. It didn't really make any waves in our, in our space. Um, and not nothing against these YouTube celebrities or anything or their followings. It's just, it just doesn't register. It doesn't translate. Yeah, it doesn't translate yet. So... They're going to keep trying, though, because that's a built-in audience. Mm-hmm. These actors that maybe have a million subscribers on YouTube, the studios are going to notice that. That's right. a, that's just like you know, following on a comic book movie. There's a large audience there, so it's kind of similar. But um, I hope they never, ever look at a following and not the talent first. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's what I hope. So I don't know, Wendy, what do you think? I mean, this is kind of like... A crappy situation for anyone who's trying to break out into Hollywood, myself mm. included, and I came out of LA to act. And it's like, well, if you have 200 and whatever followers on Instagram, okay, but you can act, but you're gonna be overlooked by someone who has, you know, 12,000, you know, followers. And that sucks, but I think the following could work for various franchises. For example, I think if they had used various YouTube stars or Instagram stars for Gem on the Holograms, Mm. That would have worked because that one mm. needed fans. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm probably going to get hate for like the people that want that, that love the original cartoon. Mm. But seeing what the film was, it was obviously geared towards like a younger audience that would have worked for the YouTube you know, stardom space. Sure. So um, it, it, I think it just really depends. I know like Smosh made a movie that was I don't know if it was in theaters. I know it's for sure it was on VOD and I think it did all right. And then using YouTube personalities in films in a way where it's like a cameo it works better like Anna Alcana was in Ant-Man she was at the end and mm-hmm. she's a huge YouTube personality when uh-huh. I saw her I was like oh Anna Alcana and then John's like who's that I was like oh, don't worry about it you won't mm-hmm. know her anyways so I think in situations like that it's cool but to overlook talent versus fan I personally have a problem with it yeah and I don't think it's it's really <laughs> happening a lot in no. say casting offices where they walk in and they're auditioning and they go great read now how many followers do you have I, I don't think that's happening mm-hmm. yet well not to my knowledge anyways. yeah not <laughs> yeah not to my knowledge either so yeah. all right what's next Michael Baker writes if Sony eventually plan on doing Venom in their Spider-Man movies and if Spider-Man is in the Infinity Wars movie could that be the origin of the black symbiote suit with Infinity Wars moving into more cosmic space, it could be an avenue to introduce the alien symbiote. Do you think this is possible? Would you want to see this, or would you prefer they just avoid it altogether for now and maybe do Venom as something separate, or maybe not at all? Uh, I don't think they will. Is it a possibility? Sure. 
I think it's too soon with where Spider-Man being rebooted with Sony in, in that story arc. The black symbiote suit kind of comes in later in Spider-Man's kind of career. Mm-hmm. And, and in the comic books, he got it during the Secret Wars, which is a storyline they may revisit yep. in Phase 4 instead of in Infinity War. So I personally don't think so. Plus, they got this Venom movie that Sony wants to do already. It's like, are they really going to, I don't know, show it happen? Maybe. Maybe. I could be wrong. Maybe there's a post credit scenes for the last Infinity War, and it shows... You know, the the Black Symbiont somehow getting to Earth. I don't know. Riley? Yeah, that's what I was thinking with Infinity War. and But it's it's confusing. So Venom movie was announced. Yeah. And it's completely separate yeah. than, than the Spider-Man that's now been rebooted and inserted into the uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe. But I immediately thought it Infinity War seems like a perfect place because I know Secret Wars. I do love that storyline. I actually really, really hope they do it because they need to do it justice. Hector... Uh, Hector um, from a Superhero Hype, and uh, he was on the show last night, and he on Schmoes No, and he said something really funny about the Spider Man, how he just finds it in his backyard in Spider Man Three or something. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I, I think it's ripe for it, and I think it would be perfect as a post credit Infinity War Part Two. Well, by then we'll have a Spider Man movie under our belt, so I don't know. Whether or not they're going to do it, I mean, we do have, I think, Dennis, you're right, we do have a lot of Spidey to get to yeah. in the new Marvel Universe. I hope they do it and get rid of this nonsense yes, Venom please. spinoff. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't think we need that. I think now that Sony has Spider-Man with Marvel, you want to keep it all together. Just have a Spider-Man movie with Venom in it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Don't, I, how are you going to do Venom without Spidey? And that's what they're trying to figure out. So. Yeah, and then will Marvel wait until they get Fantastic Four back? Because Fantastic Four... <laughs> Is is how Spider Man gets the suit off of him, right? The symbiotic, symbiotic right. suit, and then eventually, then it gets to uh, Eddie Brock. He doesn't ring the bells like he did in Spider Man Three. That's oh. that that's not canon. Mm-hmm. I'm out. All right. What's uh, <laughs> next? <laughs> James Welsh writes, "Hello, Collider, and thank you for taking my question. What are some of the best films you consider way ahead of their time that did not get a lot of appreciation on its first release?" This must be a great question because we we answered it on Movie Talk on Friday, and then uh, when we were picking out questions, we accidentally put it on twice for Mailbag on the weekend. <laughs> this is a good so question. So we were only going to do it this time. I mentioned Fight Club on, on Movie Talk on Friday. Um, uh, Clockwork Orange, when it came out, was ahead of its time. Uh, a movie that was kind of semi-panned, The Fountain, Darren Aronofsky's Fountain, which I think is a beautiful film. It's, it's kind of Aronofsky's 2001 uh, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, mm-hmm. uh, Memento, those are all kind of ahead of its time, Riley. Yeah, I think of Blade Runner. Blade Runner came yeah, out definitely. and wasn't very uh, well received. Some would even call it a bomb. And then you look back at it now and it's a masterpiece. There's been 87 director's cuts. Um, I just think, I, yeah, that's what immediately goes to my mind. I love the Fight Club too, mm-hmm. um, because that came out. Not a lot of people knew what to do with that. What was that, 99, I think it came out? Good question. I want to, but it just came out in a year, and people were. I loved it when I saw it. In yeah, the oh, me too. Same. And I came out, and I'm like, oh, and then you looked at the box office, and it not, not like it wasn't a bomb, but it just didn't do what they thought it was mm-hmm. gonna do. And you're right, 99. Yeah, came out in 99. Any for you, Wendy? Um, I, th- I thought of more like sci fi flicks, so I thought Tron mm-hmm. was one, and Fifth oh. Element. Yeah, ooh, Fifth one. Element. Mm-hmm. That was love good. That one. All right, super green. Let's go to the <laughs> last question. All right. Mojo or Moho Blaster writes, how do you feel about Paul Feig calling geeks a-holes? Do you think that he's upset that his take on Ghostbuster has been ba- has backfired? Do you think his Ghostbusters would be accepted better by fans if the remaining original Ghostbusters would show up in their original roles as opposed to just random cameos? All right, I'm going to take the last part first. Uh, do I think it would be accepted better by fans if the original Ghostbusters actors are playing the same roles? A little bit, but I don't yeah. think that's the problem. And also, do you think he's upset if they about his take has backfired? The movie hasn't come out yet, so, yeah. it, so it technically it hasn't backfired. Yet. The reception <laughs> to the trailers haven't been good, right? And and so maybe that kind of has backfired. But the movie hasn't come out yet, so we don't know if it's backfired or not. Um, I, listening to what he had to say, I actually think he's more upset at the at the vitriol that is is being thrown at the actresses themselves versus yeah. himself um and calling the geek i i understand his frustration 
we, you know, we here at Collider have to deal with this on a much smaller scale. There are certain things. Last week, we had a Game of Thrones episode that was not received very well. <laughs> and, and we got lots of hate comments for that. And, and it's one of those things. I was frustrated with it. I said some stuff, but I always said it with the caveat, some, some people. Like, mm-hmm. the question is, is he talking about all geeks? Yeah. Because that, that wouldn't be accurate. You have to always say, like, look, it's not everyone. It's just a very vocal minority of people that, that think a certain way. So I understand his frustrations. I just don't think he should just make a blanket statement and, mm-hmm. and maybe keep it to, like, okay, some of these people are being a-holes. Yeah. What about you? Yeah, I remember there was, there was one in particular that got under his skin. I remember that there was some guy that was just tweeting. It was a story that kind of spread. I remember covering it at an old outlet I was mm-hmm. with. And it was just over and over again, this guy was going after the women, he was he was being derogatory. And Fig just was finally just, you know what, F you, he just came back. And yeah. it's like, he's human, you know? He's hearing this every day on Twitter, he's getting In hit mo- up. Like, it's like a ch- big chain, like. Yeah, yeah, you look at that thread, and I did. I went, whoa, what's going on? And I followed this <laughs> thread. And this guy was relentless against Fee. And I, yeah. so he's human, yeah, he's gonna go after. It was a couple weeks ago he kind of came out and said geek culture. They're a bunch of a-holes. Mm-hmm. So that is a, a little bit of a blanket statement. I think he's in an in a unenviable position right now because of there's, – there's a couple of things that are working against him, I feel. Those press materials that came out, those Empire Magazine covers that came out a couple weeks ago with the Ghostbusters, were, they were awful. Mm-hmm. You know, So that, that, that's not helping the cause. The trailer was confusing. It said you know, four scientists – you know, 30 years ago or whatever, and you're like, wait, is this a sequel yeah, yeah. or a reboot? And then the trailer just wasn't that good. Mm-hmm. I have no problem with casting the women, and no, I, I think they're mm-hmm. all awesome, and I can't wait to see it. I, I love Paul Feig. He's a great director. But yeah, I, you know, he's human, so I, I think Yeah, that- I can't imagine because, you know, like for me, like I get trolls once in a while. Sure. You know, anytime I get more than in a few days, I'm like, oh, man, this is... They, you know, it can upset you. Yeah, but it I mean, can. I can't imagine him. He's probably dealing oh. with like times a hundred. You know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Wendy, what do you think? I think I think he's he got stuck in a sticky situation, yep. and and it's only a human. We can only get pushed so far, and finally he just lashed out, and it was just like verbal diarrhea, mm-hmm. and it came. I'm sure he didn't mean it as a blanket, like all of you are a holes. I'm sure he didn't mean it like that, but you know, we have these like online bullies and like keyboard warriors now that can say whatever as for me like if i can't look at you in the face and say the mean things that i want to say to you i wouldn't type it in the keyboard either yeah um, but that's just me so i feel bad for him i think it just bad timing for everything the trailer i'm not a fan either but am i still gonna go see the movie most likely yeah i'm still gonna go see the movie and this yeah. comment really doesn't like affect my view on him now kind of reading into it because before when i first saw the headline in the mailbag question i was like he said what <laughs> and i got mad immediately then i read into it and i'm like oh well, poor guy yeah all right guys that's it for this episode of collider mailbag I want to thank the people join us at the table. Wendy, where can people find you? You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat at Wendy Lee Zaney. And Mark Riley, where can people find you? You can find me at Riley Around on Twitter and Instagram. And I'm always popping up here on Collider Video. And if you want to go revisit the title match for the Schmodown, we just had a match. Uh, where you beat JTE. <laughs> where I beat JTE. Big time. You might want to check it out. Match. It's a lot of fun because now I'm being um, I'm being challenged a lot. Who's challenging you? Well, Jeff Snyder is challenging me. Now that he won, he's now challenging me. And uh, I don't know how well that will come out, <laughs> especially so here. Well, like when, you're, when you're the king, everyone <laughs> wants to take a shot, right? They're coming after me. What yeah. can I say? I've yeah. already stolen your belt and taken a picture with it. How dare you, Wendy? <laughs> <laughs> and you guys can find me on Twitter at Think Hero on Instagram, Dennis.TZNG. Also, you can find me on a Movie Talk Monday and Friday, and then on these weekend mailbags and also some spoiler reviews here and there. Plus, check out our channel. Subscribe, youtube.com slash Collider Videos. Tons of great videos on there. We just released a Deadpool commentary. We're going to shoot an X-Men Days of Future Past commentary this week. So check those things out, and we'll see you guys tomorrow. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.